Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout for uh, this afternoon. My name is Joe Grabowski. For those who don't know, uh, at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation into classrooms uh, across North America and hopefully beyond. Um, very excited for our guest today. We're joined uh, by James Borrell, and he's a conservation biologist based in London. He's been involved in expeditions in Oman, uh, Madagascar, Svalbard, the Peruvian Amazon, and he's also conducted research in Brunei, South Africa, um, and I'm sure more places uh, by now. So in December, he led a team of international scientists on an expedition uh, to northern Madagascar. And there they were trying to understand the effects of habitat fragmentation. So what it's doing to animal communities. Um, can these groups of animals still reach each other? So it sounds like it was a great expedition. It sounds like there were challenges along the way. And I'm sure James will share some of those with us today. So James, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Hello, everybody. I'm going to assume everyone can hear me. This is kind of weird because I'm in a little tiny room in London. And this is my first time transmitting to people in North America and Canada and all kinds of crazy places. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you're having a cool day. Uh, I was just going to show you some pictures and tell you a couple of little stories just to start with, if that's OK. So I got a lesson at the beginning on exactly how to do this. So here we go. Right. I'm going to show you a few pictures. So right. I'm guessing everybody can see that. It's that's about the can you see that? Yep, looks good. Brilliant. That's about the coolest I've ever looked, right? And it all goes very rapidly downhill um, from that. But basically, as Joe said, I, I'm, a, I'm a conservation biologist, and that means I've had the chance to work in some really, really cool places all around the world. And if anyone wants to be a conservation biologist, I'd say one of the greatest things about it is sometimes you're allowed to go to places that no one else is. So all the wildest, most beautiful parts of the world they often get protected, especially from tourists and things like that. So if you want to be a scientist, you can go to some of the weirdest, most far-flung places you can possibly imagine. It's really exciting. Um, this is in the middle of a salt pan the size of Wales. I don't know if anyone knows Wales. It's in, in the UK. Um, it's enormous. And this is just a completely flat bit of salt pan, exactly that big. Uh, and we almost sunk. Um, but that's another story. Uh, I've got to work in some really hot places and some really cold places. Um, this is a desert in Oman, and it's um, called the Empty Quarter, because there's nothing there for about a 1,000 miles. Um, but what's really amazing is I, I'm a biologist, so I thought it was going to be a bit boring. Uh, but you actually go out there, and there's all this amazing wildlife that manages to live in a completely barren desert at about 45 degrees. So it's absolutely ex really exciting. And this is where you live. If anyone wants to get a job where they end up working in a desert, this might be your house for a month. This might be where you live. Um, and as long as you have some shade, it's actually quite quite pleasant and really quite nice. Um, I've also got the chance to work in some really cold places. Um, I like the hot places because you don't have to pack as much. Um, but really, really cold places. Now, I've, I've never really been to North America or Canada, but I imagine this is kind of familiar. You get loads and loads of snow. But here in the UK, if we get just a little bit of snow, then everybody panics, the trains stop working, the cars stop working, so it's really, really different. Um, so we're not as good as you guys at, at coping with it. But So for me, just seeing any snow is really, really exciting. Um, you might go to work a really different way. If you're a scientist and, and you work in the Amazon, uh, you might have to get in a boat to go to work um, because there are, there are no roads at all. The roads are basically the rivers. So that can be really exciting. And sometimes... Very rarely, you might get to go right up into the canopy. Now, it's thought that thousands and thousands of species of animals live high up in the canopy of our forests, but because we walk on the ground, um, we never, ever get to see them. So this is out in a, a, a place called Brunei on an island called Borneo um, in Southeast Asia, and it's uh, absolutely incredible. There's so much stuff that lives there that lives nowhere else. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the science. Uh, I've had the real privilege of working on some really rare species, some really big charismatic ones, um, right down to some really little ones. This is um, out in uh, uh, Oman, where we were trying to get a picture of a very, very rare cat called the Arabian leopard. Now, in the whole world, there's only about 200 of these left. 
So there's probably more people sitting in your classrooms listening to this talk this afternoon um, than there are this animal left in the world, which is really, really sad. So we were out there trying to find it, and if we can find it, we can help trying to protect it. Um, and this is the picture we got. Now, it's a rubbish picture. You're probably all straining in your classrooms trying to see, but this is really exciting because it, was, it took a month of hard work up in the mountains to finally get this one grainy image. But what this image means is that this cat is still alive, which is, uh, which is really, really exciting for us. Uh, and someone always goes back and gets a much, much better picture. So this is a picture from, from the year after. Um, I've also worked on really, really tiny things. And if I can give you one bit of advice, if you're ever talking to anybody about science, always put a really cute picture in, because everybody loves a cute picture. Um, I, I gave a talk once, and a girl fainted because this picture was so cute. So I think I take that as a compliment. This is a little animal called a Wagner's gerbil. Uh, and we spent a month trying to catch these. Um, so it's very, very difficult. This is the only one we got, but it's very, very cute and quite sleepy. So I, I'm going to tell you one, one little story before we start talking about Madagascar, which is a place I love so much. Um, this, so I'm a big fan of NASA. You guys have NASA over there. We don't have, we don't have anything quite as cool as NASA over here. Um, but I, I really like space. And one of the reasons I like space as a conservation biologist is because it gives us some perspective on, on how amazing Earth is. Uh, and that's one of the things I think is really, really important. And one thing we don't have enough of on Earth, I think, is optimism. So I'm, I'm a very happy person. I'm really excited about conservation. But sometimes you wonder why, because we're losing so many species and we've got climate change and we've got all sorts of bad things like that. But um, sometimes you have, just have to remind yourself so I thought I would give you guys a quick who's who of some of the best, most exciting success stories in conservation. So a really, really quick whirlwind tour right around the world. Um, so at the top left, you can see a bird, and that's the Mauritius kestrel. And at one point in the 1970s, there were only four of those left in the whole world. But luckily, scientists decided that it wasn't really time to give up. Um, and they managed to, to start a captive breeding program, and there's now more than 200. Uh, you guys are a lot closer than I am, but uh, you might have heard of the Galapagos Islands, which are off the coast of South America. And so the middle photograph at the top is of an Espanol and giant tortoise that can live, it can live longer than a human. They can live up to about 150 years. But at one point, there were only 15 of them left in the world. But now, thanks to captive breeding, there's hundreds and hundreds of them, which is amazing, and they've been reintroduced. To get over to a North American species, this is pretty exciting, the black-footed ferret. That's a North American species that almost went extinct until some people were out walking in the Midwest and they happened to find a tiny little colony of them still alive and they were bred and now there's more than 2,000. Some of the other species, we'll skip to the, uh, the um, Californian condor. So the Californian condor is your largest bird. Some of you guys might have seen it. I, I never have because I've never been to, to North America, apart, apart from Florida, once. Um, but the Californian condor, the last individuals were actually captured from the wild, um, and it actually went extinct in North America. There was only a few left in, in captivity, but they managed to breed them, and they managed to release them. Um, and now there's more than 400 uh, in, in, in California, which is absolutely amazing. So well done to you guys in North America. But the last one on, on, the, on the bottom, you might recognize that one. That one's a rhino. And I'm sure you've all heard that rhinos are having a bit of a bad time in, in Africa. But this is actually a success story because this species of rhino, I think we've got a bigger picture now. This is a picture I took when I was working in South Africa. Once upon a time, this rhino was thought to be extinct. This is the southern white rhino until they discovered a tiny little group of 50 in a really remote part of South Africa. And now this is the most common species of rhino in the whole world. There's more than 20,000 of them. Um, so some of the other rhinos are, are struggling a lot, especially some of the forest rhinos and the black rhino. But it just goes to show that if you never, ever give up, then really, really, really rare things can come back from the brink of extinction, which is really exciting. Now, getting over to Madagascar, has anybody seen this duck? So this is a duck called the Malagasy potchard. Um, you have a related ducks in North America and in Europe as well. Now, this duck was extinct for about... 40 years until someone happened to be walking in a really, really remote bit of Madagascar who happened to know their ducks. 
and they saw a little group of these on a lake and they thought, hang on a minute, I thought that was extinct. Um, and so a load of scientists went out and they managed to discover this tiny little group of ducks and now they're breeding them. Um, and one day next year, the first ducks are going to be re-released back into the wild. So although there's often really loads of bad news in conservation, and, and as explorers, one of the things we do is try and um, protect and conserve endangered species, there's actually loads and loads of really, really exciting success stories. And I find it much more fun to work in a, a field where we're talking about success all the time than when we're talking about doom and gloom and pessimism. Now, sometimes, especially when, uh, especially some of the, the boys, I think, when you're in year seven, sometimes you like to see really gruesome, weird-looking animals. Um, so I thought I'd show you one more weird animal before we go to uh, Madagascar. Now, this is Lord Howe Island. Um, I've never been there, and I guess, reckon you guys have never been there, because it's very, very remote. Um, this is off the coast of Australia, which is kind of special. And living there was a really, really, really weird insect called Lord Howe Island Stick Insect. But unfortunately, it went extinct uh, because rats escaped on the island when a ship wrecked there. And this is what it looks like from, it looks like absolute paradise. If I was a stick insect, that would be an amazing place to live. But unfortunately, in the 1930s, it went extinct. And everybody thought it was extinct for 70 years. It was listed on websites as extinct. The last ones in museums had big labels that said they're extinct. But sometimes you get really, really, really adventurous explorers, and they decide to go climb something like that. Now, this is a mountain called Ball's Pyramid, and it's about 20 kilometers from, uh, or, or about 12 miles from Lord Howe Island. And some scientists thought, I wonder, I wonder if there could be anything living on that crazy pyramid. Just to show you quite how insane it is, that's what it looks like from the air. And then a few years ago, I think it was some American and Australian scientists decided to climb it. And underneath, the sing they found a single bush halfway up the side. And underneath this bush were 20 Lord Howe Island stick insects, the last of their kind in the entire world. And this is what they look like. And so this story has a moral that if we can save this species, if people are willing to climb a crazy mountain to try and see if these exist and then breed them, uh, if we can save this species, then we can save absolutely anything, because this one's really, really ugly. Um, so that's the moral of the story, is that we can save nice things like rhinos, and we can save really weird little things like the Lord Howe Island stick and tape. So to tell you a little bit about Madagascar, um, I've, got a, I've got a couple of little models of it here that I can show you when, when the screen's back on me. But on the right-hand side, you can see Madagascar. It's a really beautiful place. But unfortunately, uh, about 90% of its forest has disappeared. Oh, I'm going to skip through that. Now, for a very brief geography lesson, I'm not a geography teacher, but I pretend to be really, really quickly. The reason Madagascar is amazing is because it's separated from all of the other land masses um, hundreds, about 100 million years ago. And you can ask your teachers about that afterwards if you like. And what that means is that everything that lives there is pretty much completely unique. It's, it's an island where nothing else has changed. While the world has been carrying on around it, it's just been doing its own thing. And that makes it really, really special for biologists. Now, this is me about 10 years ago when I first went to Madagascar. I made a really big mistake. I had long hair. That was my first mistake. Um, and this is a, a Malagasy tree boa, which is a really big but totally harmless snake. And I really like to show this picture because it shows, A, that I've, I've got cooler, um, but B, that there's nothing to worry about about things like snakes. They're really, really lovely. This one was, this one was just absolutely fantastic and absolute joy to hold. Um, now, Madagascar used to be largely covered by rainforest. Unfortunately, um, a lot of that's disappeared. It's also one of the poorest countries in the world, top 10 poorest countries in the world. But one thing you might find really amazing is that although they're very, very poor and they don't have um, an awful lot of things like, like you or I do, people there are very, very happy. Um, and that's probably because they live in an amazing place like this. Um, and that, that's a real rainbow. And one of the sad things is, when you, when you work in these beautiful little pieces of forest, all around, can you see that's just grassland? And that's really, really sad. Now, I went out when I was um, just near the end of secondary school, and I'd learned all about forests and how amazing they were, but nothing I'd learned in school could have prepared me for seeing just hundreds of miles of nothing. I found it really, really sad. And so when I went back to do my A-levels, which is some exams you do when you're sort of 17 and 18 in the UK, when I came back, I decided I wanted to be a scientist. 
because I'd seen all of this sort of devastation and all of this deforestation and I really wanted to know what to do about it. Now one of the problems in science is that sometimes there's things that, that nobody knows the answer. When you're at school I find you, you, know, you can look things up in textbooks but eventually you'll finish your textbook and you guys will get great marks and you'll learn everything you're going to learn and sometimes you'll go out into the world and you'll realize that nobody knows the answer yet and that's why people work in science they're trying to explore and discover new things so somewhere there's a way of trying to reduce deforestation in Madagascar but not very many people have, have made much progress yet and so that's the big challenge in life now one thing you can do to, to reduce deforestation in Madagascar is really really simple you don't need anything really complicated all you need to do is plant trees that's the simplest thing you can do simplest one of the best things you can do for conservation and so this is a picture of us working with a team out in Madagascar where the locals collect seeds from the trees and they plant them in nurseries um, and, they, and, they, and they plant them out trying to connect little pieces of forest back up now in Madagascar, the people who normally do the tree planting are the lemurs. The lemurs run around eating fruit, and they eat the fruit, and then when they poo the fruit out, that, those seeds grow into great big trees eventually. But unfortunately, lots of the lemurs have disappeared. So by us doing it, it helps give space for the lemurs to come back, um, and eventually Madagascar might be covered in forest again. This is a, a picture of us hauling some um, seedlings all the way up on the hillsides. I might not have mentioned, but Madagascar is really, really hilly, um, so it's very, very hard work. Um, this is the first one we planted. It's just a little seedling, but it's a really sort of kind of profound, exciting thing when you plant your first little seedling. So just before Christmas, um, I led another expedition out, and this this shows you the the grassland we had to walk over for um, for a whole day just to manage to reach the forest, because anywhere where there's a village, a lot of the forest has disappeared. And we had a whole army of local porters to help us carry all our equipment in. We had about a ton, about a thousand kilograms of equipment that we had to, to carry in. And that had to be all our food and everything we would need for about five weeks. So it took about 30 people helping us to manage to get it all in. And they'd never seen anyone like us before. So they were all really, really interested to see what we were doing. And in the background, you can just about see a bit of the forest that we were there to work on. This is, a, this is an edge. So one thing you think about is you have these amazing bits of forest and then these amazing bits where all the forest has disappeared. And this is like the front line of conservation. This is what we, we spent a, a really long time trying to reach. This is where the forest disappears. And this is where we worked. And what, we were, what you can do is you can actually look at satellites. The technology is absolutely amazing now. You can actually see these bits of forest from satellites in space. And this is what we were going out to see. So I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen frogs uh, and lizards and things before, uh, maybe in the local pond or in your local park. Madagascar's got about different types of amphibians and about 300 different types of lizards and geckos and other reptiles. So it's really, really hard to remember what they all are. So I have a really, really, really thick book. Um, and I took a few experts with me as well who knew them much, much better than me. Um, so we were trying to find all of these guys and trying to use these animals to tell us what's happening in the forest. But I just really love these pictures because they just show the amazing diversity of life. This is one of the babies. Um, they lay eggs and some nights you get loads of chameleons hatching out. Uh, and that just shows how tiny and helpless they are. But they're not afraid how tiny and helpless they are when they're born. Um, and this, th that one's me, uh, not the frog, the person, that's me. Um, and this is a frog that's really exciting because we don't actually know what it is. And, and when you don't know what it is um, and you've got people with you who are expert on frogs, that's about as exciting as it gets. So we're not sure yet, but we think that might be a new species of tree frog, um, which was pretty cool because to catch it, it was five meters up a tree and we had to shake the tree and try and catch it as it fell out. So that was really exciting. Um, and the last picture I'm just going to show you was Christmas Day. Um, Think about where you were on Christmas Day. I wished I was at home with my family and my, and my girlfriend and my friends. But sometimes when you're doing science, Christmas is the best time to be away. Um, and so this was our, our Christmas in the middle of the rainforest. We had a feast. Um, and that was the one day we didn't do any work. And it was a, it was a really, really nice. We even took Christmas decorations. Um, so that's my little story about Madagascar. Um, so I'll come out of that. And 
we can we can you can ask some questions. You can ask what the toilets were like or and things like that. Whatever you like. All right, James. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, if you so just I need to press the, the, the green button one more time, you'll come back. Uh, yeah. Hang on. Cool. Can You're you see back. Me now? All right. Hello. Um, well, awesome. Thank you so much. That was a great little journey to take, and I really like that you share those success stories first because you're absolutely right. You turn on the news or read an article on the internet, and it's all about what we're losing. It's really it's yeah, good to hear yeah. those positive stories. So I think you're right. Things are kind of bad. There's loads and loads of things that, that still need to be done, but you have to remember in your head that if we did nothing, things would be a lot worse. So, so never, ever give up. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's hit some questions. I'm going to introduce the classrooms joining, give them a chance to say hi. I'll turn their mics on as I introduce them, and then uh, we'll start the questions. So let's see. Let's start with, we have, oops, there we go. Um, Mrs. Gabor's grade 9 geography class, Abbey Park High School in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. How's it going? Yeah. All right, there's the first group. Then we have a group joining us from Immaculate Conception. They're a grade six class in Prince George. How's it going, everyone? Yeah. All right. Then in Virginia, we have a big group joining us today. We have... Uh, from Algonquian Elementary, third graders in Sterling, Virginia, and there's four classes joining in multiple locations, but we have a group who's in front of the camera right now. How's it going, guys? Hi, Virginia. Awesome. And last but not least, we have uh, my grade sevens here in Guelph, Ontario. Uh, your class is the most excitable. <laughs> All right. They're pretty excited. Oh, I can't hear your sound now. Oh, there we go. My, my mic got pulled. Um, let's start with those grade threes in Virginia. Go ahead. My name is Mason. What is, what is your favorite animal? Mason, was it? My favorite animal? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a really difficult one. What's my favorite animal? Um, sometimes I like things that you almost couldn't imagine exist. Um, like some really, really, really weird things and you sort of think, is that real or someone just made that up? So one of my favorite animals is the pangolin um, because it's just really, really hard to describe. It's like a, it's got an armored shell and it can roll up into a ball and it just looks like it's um, straight out of you know, 100 million years ago um, and, it's, and it's still around now. It's really, really strange. Um, You'll be able to find loads of pictures of them on the internet, but they kind of eat termites and insects, and they sort of scurry around with their big claws. They're really, really strange. It's my favorite animal. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's Samantha, and I was wondering what made you try and save the rainforest? Oh, hello, Samantha. That's a really good question. Um, I, guess, I guess when I was when I was 17 and I first went to a rainforest, it just gave me so much enjoyment. I really, really liked it. And what made me sad was that I was enjoying it and I thought that by the time I was an old man, it might have disappeared. And I realized that I could enjoy it at the same time as... And sometimes when you, when you concentrate really hard on something, when you try and learn as much about it, you actually enjoy it even more. So I could enjoy a rainforest just by sta you know, standing in it, walking through it. But sometimes if you're looking around for frogs and reptiles, you discover all these strange and weird things and you enjoy it even more. So I guess I just like the idea that when I'm an old man, it'll still be there, which is a long time. I'm, I'm going to be old in many, many, many years. I'm, I'm quite young still, promised. But hopefully by the time I'm an old man, it'll still be there, and that's what I hope for. Good question. Thank you. All right, let's grab one more question from the group over there, and we'll visit another class after that. Hi, my name's Sophia. I was wondering when did the when did 
did the tree cutting start to like, become a bigger problem? You, you're one, you're Sophia, and you're wondering when what? Sorry. Okay. When tree cutting. When tree cutting started to be a problem in Madagascar. Ah, okay. Good question. Um, well, we actually think for a really long time. So Madagascar is quite unusual. Um, in that humans have only lived on Madagascar for about 2,000 years. So that's the first time we it was colonized, about 2,000 years ago. And we think that slowly over that time, we, we live more and more, more fast. And now on Madagascar, there's about 22 million people. Um, so it's the last few hundred years. It's not a really recent problem. It's It's been going on for quite a few hundred years. Just the same in, as the rest of the world. Here in Europe, we cut down almost all of our forests quite a few thousand years ago. So it's kind of a problem all around the world. But but good question. Thank you. All right, let's visit our classroom. Uh, our grade sixes, your microphone's on. Have you ever been injured in any of your work? <laughs> good question. Um, not, not, not really, not yet. Um, but come close a little bit. When I was in Madagascar at Christmas, um, I got a an infection in my foot, which made my foot grow really big. Um, but fortunately, that was all right. Um, one of the one of the things that was scariest was in the middle of the night, a really big bit of tree fell down um, right next to my tent. Um, it, it, so sometimes when trees get really old, their branches fall off and things like that. Um, but fortunately, no one was nearby and it, it wouldn't have hit us anyway. But that was kind of scary. But really being in London can be really scary sometimes. So not too bad. Did the people in the village in Madagascar, did they speak the same language? Uh, no. So, so in Madagascar? They speak about 20 different varieties of Malagasy, which is the, the local language. Um, and quite a lot of them speak French as well, uh, because Madagascar was a French colony for a little bit. Um, I'm very, very bad at speaking other languages. Um, so we, we managed to speak a little bit in French, but I had some really, really nice people with me that could help me translate. But no, they speak a com completely different language. Okay, uh, Emerson. So I have a, I have a comment. You know, um, when you saw, like, when you um went to Madagascar and saw um grass, there were like no animals. I was wondering if you can like take the animals from other countries and like put them in Madagascar. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, so one of the things that in in some places you you can do that, yeah. Um, one of the problems in Madagascar is that everything in Madagascar is so unique. So if you took them from other countries, firstly they might not survive because it's not it's not their habitat. But sometimes we have an impro we have a problem with things called invasive species, and that's where um, I don't know if you guys know, but for example in um, in the Caribbean off Florida a few years ago, a lionfish um, was accidentally released, and it what it did was it ate all the local fish. And so lionfish have become a really big problem. So sometimes, as conservationists, we sometimes think we know best, but sometimes moving species around actually causes more problems than just trying to protect the ones that are there. But it's a good question. It's sometimes something we have to think about. But moving other species might make more problems than it, than it solves. All right. And that's uh, an interesting one you brought up, the lionfish. I was doing some diving in Mexico not too long ago, and, and we did see quite a few lionfish on the reef and, and I've read they've spread even as far as Panama and further now so they're definitely yeah. liking the new place but it's not so good Probably. for the ecosystem. Okay, um, before we go to our next class I'm just going to share my screen for a second because um, I grabbed a picture of the penguin so we can share that with the, ah, with the groups that are watching so just let me switch over. There we go. Can you guys see that? There's a pangolin. So it just looks strange, doesn't it? And one of the things that's kind of a little bit strange is that lots of people really like to eat them. The biggest, the biggest threat to pangolins is is people eating them because apparently they taste really, really good. And um, I, I prefer chicken. 
but um, but yeah, lots of people eating them. All right, so we have our grade nine class, our high school class. Your microphone's on for some questions. Do you have a question? There's a question up there. I have a question. What's the, okay. what's the most powerful place you've been to? The one that's made the biggest impact on you? Oh, okay. Um, well, kind of the, the first time I went to Madagascar, that kind of had the biggest impact on me because it kind of decided everything I I would carry on doing with the rest of my life. Um, but I've been to some other places that were kind of really strange. A few years ago, um, I was part of a big sailing trip right across the Atlantic, and at one point we were a thousand miles from the nearest land, and all there is is just ocean in every direction. Um, so that kind of makes you feel really, really, really small. Um, so that's it's a really good feeling. Sometimes it's really good to just kind of get perspective on how massive everything is. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one over here. Um, what would you say is the most dangerous animal in Madagascar? The most dangerous the most animal in Madagascar. Wow, okay. Um, aside from humans, um, the most dangerous animal in Madagascar. So one of the reasons that it's really good to be a scientist in Madagascar is because they've got loads of snakes, but actually none of them are poisonous, which is really, really unusual, and, and pretty much none of the frogs are poisonous um, either. So actually, the most dangerous thing in Madagascar is the mosquito. So lots of people might think of the, these big animals, but the mosquito kills far more people than all of the other animals put together, I would say, um, and that's the thing you have to be most careful of. So that's kind of a, I've given you a kind of trick answer there, um, but it's a really, really good point, and that's what's killing a lot of people in, in Madagascar. Here we have one more question. Yeah. Um, so, like, if you go to places without a like, human, what do you eat? What would you eat? Can you repeat that? Like, when you go to like places without like people, what do you eat? What, if what you go to without other people. Yeah. If you go to very remote places, what is it that you're eating? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um. So when we're in Madagascar, we pretty much have to eat whatever all the people in Madagascar eat. Um, sometimes we try and buy quite a lot of tinned food because it keeps for a really long time. Um, but in Madagascar, the, the main food is rice um, and beans. So we pretty much ate rice and beans um, every day. We did buy two chickens from the village and we took them into the forest with us. And on Christmas Day, we killed and ate the chickens, which was a, a real treat for us. My favorite food when I was in Madagascar, which is something that you can get in America, you can get in Canada, you can get in the UK, but it's just not the same, is what they call tantelli, and that's honey. And one of our guides was an expert at finding beehives and raiding the beehives. So he'd light a fire and he'd put his hand in and he'd take bits of honeycomb out. And if you've not had anything sweet for several weeks and you eat a piece of honeycomb straight out of a beehive, it's just the most best bit of food. It's better than any sweets you can possibly imagine. Um, and it's just the best food ever. So that was my favorite food. But all the other food is just whatever the locals eat. All right. Good questions. Let's steal two from my class. Here's Frankie. On over, Hi, Frankie. Hello. My question is, what's the weirdest animal you've seen and you would like to see? Oh, the weirdest animal I've seen... Um, Ah, okay, yep. Um, so the weirdest animal I've seen, maybe, is an animal called a coligo. Um, maybe your teacher can can find a picture of that. Um, it looks completely like a bit of tree, um, but it's actually kind of like a squirrel slash primate that has webs between its arms and legs, and it can fly. Um, so yeah, so coligo. But they're really hard to see because they just sit on the side of a tree like this, and nobody. No, but you just walk past them. You walk straight past them. The weirdest other animal I would like to see, um, I'd really like to see an eye eye, which just has a strange name. But what it has is it has a, a, a middle finger that's really, really bony. And you know how a woodpecker um, eats grubs out of tree trunks and things like that? Well, it climbs up tree trunks, 
and it taps on them like this, and it kind of listens for them. And when it finds a little grub underneath the bark, it sticks this really long finger in and pulls it out. And there's nothing like it anywhere else on Earth. And it's really, really rare, and it lives in Madagascar. So, so wow. yeah, the Kologoa I've seen and the eye I would like to see. That's pretty cool. Thanks. Welcome. All right, come on up, Dominic. Hello. Hi, Dom. My question is, what's your favorite place in Madagascar? My favorite place in Madagascar? Well, um, that's a difficult question. My my favorite place in Madagascar, um, I would say it would have to be my base camp. So I spent um, I spent about a year and a half planning this expedition, and I'd never been to the place we were going to, and so I just looked at maps. Every day I was just looking at maps, um, and I kind of got to know it all really, really well, even though I'd never been there. And then when we finally got there, with all this equipment, we'd been traveling for days, and we were all completely exhausted, and we finally got to this little point on the map that I'd been looking at for a year, and we made it our home. And we made it home, and we lived there for five weeks, and we had really, really funny things, and we had massive storms, and we just had so many experiences. And it was just a tiny little bit of forest, just like the next bit, but for the rest of my life, I'll always remember that little place, just in, in that little bit of forest. All right, thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, James, do you have time? Maybe we'll visit um, our two elementary classes for a wrap-up yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. So let's see. Uh, in Sterling, Virginia, do you guys have a final question for? Uh, yes, we have one here. All right. Hello. One more. Hi. My name is Fabiola, and what is the most endangered animal in Madagascar? Oh, Fabiola. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, there's actually quite a lot. Um, so we have this we have this thing that we call Lazarus species, um, and they are species that have possibly gone extinct, um, but we don't know for sure. So one of the things is really hard to know if a species has completely gone extinct unless you look really really hard for it. So there's there's a, a chameleon called Kaluma Hafa Hafa. And what that means in English is the bizarre-nosed chameleon, because it has a really, really weird nose like this. Um, and it's only been seen twice in history. Um, and so that's really rare. We don't know if it's still alive. There's also a type of lemur um, called the um, silky safaka. It's a really cool name. And it's completely white. It's got really long hair. It's white. It looks, it looks fabulous. Um, and it only lives in a tiny, tiny bit of forest in a really, really remote part of Madagascar. Um, and so it's really, really rare and very, very hard to see. But unfortunately, there's lots. I could, I could pick loads and loads of different, different animals. Um, but that's, that's Madagascar. That's why it's so special. All right. So before I jump to the grade six class, I did find a picture of the animal you were just talking about. So let me share yeah. my screen, and we'll, we'll take a look. There we go. Yeah, that's a colligo. That's a that's a kind of that's a easy to spot picture of it. It's it's getting ready to fly there, but sometimes when they completely camouflage themselves, you just can't see them at all. Um, and there's, oh, they're, yeah, oh. there's one of it flying. There's one of it flying. How strange is that? How strange is that? <laughs> Pretty strange. cool. Yeah. Amazing. So point, and you might get to see one. All right, and let's take one final question from our grade sixes. Your mic's on if you have one. Uh, James, um, have you ever saw a poison dart frog? Have I ever, what, sorry? Have you ever seen a poison dart frog? A poison dart frog? Um, uh, no, I haven't. I've never got to see a poison dart frog. Um, I've seen lots of tree frogs, but none of them were poisonous. Um, but out in, out in South America, I did work in, in uh, the Amazon for a little bit, and there's lots of them there. But they're really, really hard to see. I had one. I have one really funny, really quick story, and that's I was sleeping in a hammock one night, um, and because it was really hot, um, I didn't have a t-shirt on or anything, and I was just laying in this hammock fast asleep, and I had a mosquito net, and I was completely wrapped up to keep mosquitoes away. And in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, I felt what what felt like a really big wet fish just land on my chest right there. And I opened my eyes, and it was a really big tree frog just looking at me. It somehow got into my hammock. And I screamed, 
and I woke up everybody in the whole camp because it shocked me so much. So I had a really close encounter with an enormous tree frog, but it wasn't poisonous. But good question. All right, good story too. Well, James, thank you so much for today. Um, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed the hangout. I learned a lot, and I'm sure that a lot of our classrooms joining today did learn a lot. And um, the conservation message you shared, you know, that there's the good and the bad, I think is an important one for students to know as well. So we definitely look forward to following future travels and hopefully having you back for another hangout in the future. I'd love to. Really nice to meet you all. I hope you all have a really nice day and go out and see some fantastic wildlife. Oh, I've been all over the world, but I've never been to where you guys live. So you've got some amazing wildlife I'd love to see. So go and enjoy it. All right, microphones are coming on so the classes can say goodbye and then we'll we'll sign off. All right. Thanks everyone for today. Uh, enjoy your evenings, enjoy your afternoons, and we'll see you next time.